Well, well, welcome back, everyone. I'm going to kick off our afternoon session. Uh, we have Alex Rad with us this afternoon. He, he told me just now that his first recon was nine years ago, so that's really awesome. It's great to have him back to give a talk this year. Uh, and he's going to be talking about his research into flaws in VR, which I'm sure is uh, a lot of fun to do research in and probably has some pretty wide-ranging ramifications. Thank you. Hello, Recon. I'm happy to be here. You guys ready for some VR VR? What have you ever done? VR VR VR. And uh, yeah, as Kate mentioned, I was first here in 2010, uh, so it's been a little while. Uh, I remember uh, my first recon. I was living with one of my friends who uh, had never had a vacation in his life. And so he was passed out in my uh, grandma's little Toyota Corolla, uh, sleeping quite well, laughing his ass off while we were hydroplaning in a terrible thunderstorm. Uh, so uh, it's been a while, uh, but I've been working security for quite a bit. I got my start with Matasano, uh, working on Wall Street. They wanted some finance clients. Uh, and we had a few, some dark liquid pools, stuff like that. And it was a small little office with no windows and three big desks and three big chairs. And as an intern, that was amazing because they could basically hear me think. And all the stupid little questions I had, they had to answer because it would have been rude to ignore me in such a small space. I've also worked at Apple, um, worked at CrowdStrike a bit, uh, I was at Spotify, and now I'm at a small little firm called Long Term Security Inc. Uh, any RPI Sec people in the crowd here? Yeah. So uh, RPI Sec had two dads, and I'm proud to say that I was one of the RPI Sec dads. We started that club in like 2007 ish, 2008. We were passing like PowerPC notes, assembly notes uh, to each other. And our teacher was like, hey, are you guys passing notes? He picks it up. He's like, this is assembly. And he put it back down. <laughs> so that, that's the origin story of RPI Sec. Uh, also CTF team uh, that probably nobody wants to play with anymore because we got disqualified for hacking. Yeah, we still lost. We only hacked because we thought we could win, but it just doesn't work out that way sometimes. And uh, most recently I talked about iCloud Keychain at Black Hat a couple of years ago. They had another flaw very similar to go to fail. So if anybody here works with static analysis, you guys might have missed that one. Excuse me, I just had some audio pop up. And uh, some of this research was done with my team, so we're a distributed team, and we actually hang out in VR, play some paintball, do some bowling. And uh, a lot of this work was done uh, with my teammate, Philip. Uh, he couldn't be here, unfortunately, uh, because he's celebrating his wedding anniversary. And um, so what is this really about? So if you're a thought leader, you might realize that this isn't really real, it's just a simulation, you know, we're like, on some tape machine in some other galaxy or something. And, you know, proof of this is left as an exercise to the reader because it's so simply obvious to everyone. Uh, so thank you for attending. And uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, we can listen to Tony Stark over here. He talks about this constantly. Um, I mean, maybe reality is inside of a little ambient bottle. I'm not sure. Uh, but he's pretty convinced. And if Tony Stark doesn't convince you, uh, we can listen to one of the best hackers that's ever lived, George Hotz. And he had a talk this March at South by Southwest about how we are living in a simulation. And he's done a lot of hacking, and he knows that uh, basically, if you're in a simulation, that means somebody can debug you. And he doesn't like that. He wants to take control of the simulation. So he's going to start a religion uh, where they're going to jailbreak reality. And people are laughing, but this is not a joke. He's legitimately concerned about this. And um, a comedian astronomer named Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, he's very entertaining. He also says that, yeah, we're, we might be living in a simulation. So let's break out. You guys ready? Who wants to do it? Who's brave enough? Raise your hand if you've ever crashed a program. Raise your hand if you've ever crashed a kernel. What happened when your kernel crashed? Machine stopped working. You couldn't move that mouse anymore. 
Are you guys really ready to break out of reality? I'm not sure because we don't really know what we're doing, so it's probably going to crash. I mean, we wouldn't know because it would stop, but that still sounds kind of bad. So instead, today, we'll do something a little bit safer. We're going to break out of virtual reality, which is a safe space with unsafe pointers. Have you guys ever dealt with unsafe pointers? Yeah, some native code. That's what we're all about here at this conference. Uh, so what is virtual reality exactly? Uh, people have been working on similar technology for quite a while, pretty much since we figured out we could make like moving pictures in front of our head. Uh, this was a device called the Sword of Damocles. Uh, and it was named so because the thing was so heavy, they had to have a robotic arm following you around the room. And it's a reference to some Greek mythology or something where uh, power is very dangerous and it's like a sword hanging over your head. And uh, this man here is named uh, uh, Jaron Lanier, and he's responsible for coining the term virtual reality. It wasn't really called virtual reality in the 60s. They're just thinking about the same things, but they didn't call it that. And the reason he calls it virtual reality is because to him, uh, it was something he, ever, he always wanted. He lost uh, his parents when he was quite young, and uh, he thought a lot about connecting with people and how to be close to one another. And he was thinking all the time, like, how can you share dreams with other people? So that's what virtual reality meant to him. And uh, I've got a link here when you download the slides where he has an interview where he talks about this and some of his ideas. And one thing he's actually worried about is that uh, he thinks we really messed up the internet. He thinks it's totally garbage now with all the ads and the social media and stuff, and he doesn't like it. And uh, he's a little bit concerned that in virtual reality, it's going to be that, but like even worse, because if you've tried virtual reality before, you know it can be a little bit more intense. It's like going someplace else especially as the devices get better. Um, that's not really my department, though. I'm not a behavioral psychologist. I don't sell ads. I don't know much about that stuff. But I do know a little bit about security bugs. And I think there's a new opportunity here with some of the technology. We don't care about legacy. Uh, so maybe we shouldn't make the same kind of garbage software that we're used to making. And uh, hacking and virtual reality have always been uh, kind of one and the same in some of the sci-fi that's out there. Uh, has anybody here read this book, Neuromancer? Came out a long time ago, 1984. Um, and uh, there was basically this hacker, and he did a lot of bad stuff. Uh, he, he was so bad that society decided to chemically castrate his brain so that he could no longer plug into the matrix. And then uh, someone wanted to take down some megacorps, so they jacked him back in. Uh, and then, has anybody heard about this book, Snow Crash? Uh, so this is a book by Neil Stevenson, and um, it might be satire, it might not be, uh, but there's a lot of like weird stuff that happens, and one of the things in this book is that people get hacked in virtual reality so bad that their brain melts, and they die. Let's see if it works. All right, is everybody still here? All right, we're good. All right, all right. But it's not all necessarily scary. I mean, there's a lot of cool things that you can do virtual reality. If you do any kind of 3D modeling, if you do design, if you want to uh, experience what it's like to be a bird, there's a lot of potential there. And you can do it from your living room. Or if you're like on an airplane and you're claustrophobic, you can put on a headset and hang out at the beach. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how virtual reality is made. And um, you know, what, how is it different than looking at a computer screen? Uh, so you've got a few different components. Uh, you've got a head-mounted display. So this is just a Vive. This is um, old technology at this point. This came out in 2016. Uh, you, this goes on your head. There's some screens inside. Uh, and then you've got some uh, trackers, some controllers here. Uh, and uh, this device uses uh, something called lighthouses. They're just sending infrared lights, kind of like a TV remote, and that helps the tracking work. Uh, and inside this display, you have these high-resolution screens that are only going to get more high-resolution uh, and faster. Um, and then the really important part is that they have lenses. And the lenses are what bend light and let you feel like you're seeing something that's very big or very far away, even though it's only a few inches from your face. And on the headset, on the trackers, you have little sensors that are detecting the lights. Other devices actually send out the lights, and the trackers receive them, so there's some variability there. And other people will just do it optically with image recognition. And you have a few other things there, too. 
And um, I've got some uh, pictures that kind of explain a little bit more of like why does it look like you're somewhere else. Um, basically, you actually have two images coming in, one for each eye that are slightly different apart, just like your eyes are a little bit apart, unless you're a cyclops. Um, yeah, it, it can happen. Uh, I know a kid, there's a slingshot, shit happens. But uh, stay safe out there. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's bad. And um, in addition to that, you've got these lenses. And the lenses really bend the light, kind of like um, how a lighthouse can focus light to make it go much further away. If you do that backwards, you can make it seem like light is coming from far away. And these lenses will naturally distort the image in what's called a pincushion distortion. It will basically like, squeeze the image in. So when the games are rendering the graphics, you get kind of like this fishbowl barrel distortion. And they do that because when it comes through lenses, it flattens out again, and you see something more natural. And uh, virtual reality is just one of, the way, w one of the ways people are trying to bend reality. Other people are working on uh, some of the AR stuff, like if you guys have heard of HoloLens or Magic Leap, um, and then applications like Snapchat, they just show you on a display a, a different stream. And then there's really high-end sets out there, like the Vario XR1, where they're showing you real-time video on your head-mounted display and then augmenting it there. And it's used by companies like Volvo for doing test drives of the cars they're building today. And there's a, a shit ton of applications for this. I, I think design is a big one. Uh, another really big one uh, that a lot of industries are looking at is training. There are people that fly halfway around the country to use one machine that costs couple hundred million dollars or more for whatever s industry they work with and instead of flying people out all the time you can start training people in VR you can teach people to drive car fly airplanes operate semiconductor equipment uh, do medicine potentially uh, there's a lot of people that don't live in a city there's people that live on a farm and maybe they're into coding and they don't have any friends nearby so there's a huge social opportunity as well for connecting people therapy uh, people are looking at combat like uh, Mecha Warriors, for example, those seem kind of cool. Uh, but today it's mostly games. Uh, so we did some game hacking for you today. And uh, so what are our goals? Our goals are to uh, basically break out of some of these games, understand how they work. And uh, we don't want to just um, you know, glitch the games locally. We want to do snow crash level. We want to take it uh, to like scary level, because that's more interesting. And we're going to show you today uh, some cyber weapons in VR. And why does anyone even care about securing VR? Um, one, you're kind of vulnerable. You've got this headset on. It's got webcam. It's got a microphone. There's some privacy concerns there. And uh, we almost called one of our exploits to Toe Stubber for that reason. And um, you guys watch Black Mirror? There's some dark shit there. so. You could probably do some dark shit with RC on a headset, so let's not do that. And uh, VR is actually a big security challenge, so it is an innovation space where you've got an innovation race, and you've got keyboard cowboys that are shipping first and asking questions later, taking shortcuts using game engines written in the 90s and combining them with web browsers that are six months out of date. And uh, new devices, new hardware, new challenges, they have to solve the wheel again. And uh, these are the games we looked at. Has anybody here heard of VRChat? Awesome. I, for I forget my handle, but you probably shouldn't add me anyway. It'll probably be bad for your computer. Um, High Fidelity, anybody hear of that one? Not as well known, but it's a pretty interesting one. And um, we also looked at Steam VR Home. Um, so uh, we're going to do a demo for you guys, and I'm going to ask my uh, friend Jay to come up. And uh, let's get him set up in VR. So uh, we're just going to have him hang out while I tell you a little bit more about what's going on. And let's see if he can see anything out here. Uh, one second. Is the is the headset working for you? Turn on the controller. Hit uh hit the bottom button.
Let's see. Just a second. Uh, do you have power? Let me see. One second. Uh, okay. Yeah, the demo gods are already trying to debug what's going on here. Um, all right, I'm gonna just uh, quickly unplug the HDMI for your screen, put it back in. Okay, I didn't see that. Let me. Uh, uh, so basically, Steam VR Home is. Um, a playground that Valve makes uh, for people to try out VR, and they have uh, different custom environments. Just restarting it right now. And uh, yeah, so right now Jay's in my Hong Kong apartment with uh, a rooftop patio pool, hanging out. So if you guys want to check out my crib later, just let me know. Um, and uh, yeah, y you do you, I'll do me for a little while. Um, okay, so Steam VR Home. It's basically like a desktop for VR made by Steam. You can go in, launch games, you can invite your friends, come hang out, say what's up. And uh, they've got this cool thing called a workshop uh, where anybody can um, run an environment. And it runs on the Source Engine. And uh, Source Engine is uh, riddled with uh, security holes, turns out. Uh, a few years ago, Amat Kama of the famous fluoracetate hacking team had some cool remote exploits. I've got links to some other previous bugs that people have found. And uh, you've got lots of attack surfaces. There's network parsing, there's scripting, there's parsing of custom map files, rendering of videos, shaders, all that fun GPU stuff, uh, custom audio protocols, and much more. And uh, these custom environments are easily accessible, anybody can publish them on the internet. Um, and you can make games using something called Hammer, which is a game tool. And uh, uh, we thought about how we would hack this, and we decided scripting is probably super, super buggy. Uh, and it was, and um, there's two different kinds of scripting. So there's scripting that the game server runs. Uh, in the case of uh, Steam Tours or Steam VR Home, uh, this is an interface with Lua, and uh, it's implemented with Lua JIT. And then there's something called Panorama, which is basically a web browser used for displaying a UI. And uh, uh, it uses V8, uh, but the other stuff is all custom. And this also affects things like Dota 2 and CSGO. Uh, so we started off by looking at the Lua scripting. Uh, and they've got an API that's a little bit interesting, uh, but they actually harden this quite a bit. So Anybody here do game hacking? You've probably looked at hacking some Lua before, right? So you know that if you can inject Lua opcodes, you can very quickly get memory corruption and get out. Or there are modules like I.O. Um, that let you just run commands. They lock those down. Uh, but we did find some bugs. Uh, in some of their custom APIs, you could create log files with directory traversal. And um, you could exploit that by dropping down an install script, for example. So the next time somebody ran Steam, after visiting your environment, they would get this little prompt here for running stuff as admin. Um, but that's not really exciting, because if you host your own environment and hacking yourself, I mean, that's kind of cool, but we set out to do a little bit better. So we took a look at this thing called Panorama, and it is really a web browser. You've got CSS, HTML, JavaScript. There's an XML parser. Uh, there's a lot of rich attack surface here. It's not a full-featured uh, JavaScript environment, though. You don't have things like uh, ES5, WebAssembly, and so on. But what you can do is you can load a real browser inside of the web browser where you do get all those other things. So you can do stuff like stream YouTube inside of your VR environment. And uh, they have a custom JavaScript API uh, where you can do stuff like create those panels, uh, do events to send events between different players in the server, and also script actions about objects in the game. And uh, we found type confusion in um, a lot of these APIs. 
And um, uh, basically, they're, they're casting objects incorrectly. And that let us do a little bit of memory corruption. Um, and it's a little bit strange, because the code does do some type checking. So when you pass in your parameters, it says, hey, uh, we're looking for a JS object. Is this an array? Is this a JavaScript array? Nah, we don't want that. Is it a function? Nah, we don't want that. Is this a number? All right, let's typecast it. Let's run it. And uh, oh, what is going on there? Um, OK, so uh, in terms of exploitability, I uh, took a quick look. So quick rundown, 64-bit process, uh, very weak ASLR, just the standard Windows stuff. The JavaScript engine isn't hardened, much like the way Chrome is, in terms of hardening heap allocations and randomizing them. Uh, we could do some heap spraying with V8. And we also noticed that the Lua JIT region has a RWX area of memory that we could inject code into. Uh, so we uh, create a fake function uh, with a bunch of function pointers. Um, and then we'll heap spray our fake data everywhere. And um, we're basically just going to pass in our fake object, which will trigger some function pointer calls, uh, along with a couple of writes, where we're going to inject some code. And um, let's do a demo of that. Are uh, you ready, Jay? You ready? All right. Let's see. Uh, what do you see right now? Oh, that's not great. All right. Um, look, at, look to your left. Stand back a little bit, because you're blocking the trackers. Here, I'm going to move you. All right. Let's come this way. Uh, all right. Look to the left. All right. There we go. Yeah. All right. Hey, Jay, I heard about this new street drug you should try out. It's called Snow Crash. Right. It's totally rad. Go do it. Oh, j actually, wait one second. Let's see. All right. And uh, could we get the split screen view? And uh, we've got Metasploit running on another laptop over there. Let's see. All right. So we just uh, got a little shell there. So how do you feel? I'm nervous. Oh, yeah? What's that skull thing over there? What's going on? All right. No? Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm sure it's fine. You're just playing a video game, dude. Oh, let's see. Oh, uh, so we basically have full code execution on the... Um, Oh, uh, one sec. Let's see. Okay. All right. But uh, we really have a lot of control over Jay. So we control his visual and his audio and his feelings. And uh, you're great, Jay. Thank you for being here. Thank you kindly. Let's see. Uh, turn on the webcam. I think my audio is up. You guys want a stream or you want a picture? Let's try a stream out. So uh, let me just bring this over. Uh, so we've got a webcam stream coming out from the Vive. So, oh, I picked the wrong uh, camera there. Huh? All right, let's do that again. Is this cow factory wood? <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> I think we need index two. All right. Whoa. Uh, yeah, might as well to fuck some shit up. <laughs> but uh, uh, hop back in. Hop back in. All right. And, uh, we'll, we'll bring that up a little bit later. But we basically have full control over the system. Uh, video games don't really do any mitigations. There's no sandboxing.
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's uh, you're kind of you're you're gonna be stuck with this for life. Cal Calc hands. All right. All right. You you can take it off if you need to. Thank you, Jay. Everyone's still alive? Everyone's good? All right. It's a little scary, right? Like, if this happens to you, you're at home, someone's got your webcam. If they want to stub your toe, they're going to stub your toe. You can spin people, get a little noxious. It's not great. And uh, there's tons of other attack surface here. Um, and uh, I guess the interesting thing here is in VR, we're really interested in user generated content. So, we're taking stuff that wasn't a security boundary before, kind of like when we put your PCI Express bus on Thunderbolt. Um, we're doing this with game engines. We're now putting them on the internet and letting anybody load games. Uh, who's heard of VRChat? Awesome. Um, it's uh, about two years old now, launched February 2017. Uh, for social, gaming, and um, Maybe I'll switch to the other mic because this keeps breaking out. You guys hear me? All right, let's do this for a little while. All right, so VR chat. Um, don't take your kids to VR chat, seriously. Just, I've seen things that I cannot unsee, and I want to unsee them desperately. I've seen forms that Pikachu should not evolve into. I, I wish I was kidding. No, it was like, I don't want to do this research anymore. And um, it's a weird place. But it's probably for adults only. So pr protect yourself. Uh, but it's really popular because uh, it's really weird, which makes it really interesting. And basically everything is player generated and it has on any given day about 10,000 different users. So VR chat might be the future of the web. And uh, people make their own content and if you guys have heard of Unity before, you can basically ship Unity games to other people with a little bit less code unless you find out how to inject your own code. And uh, they make a SDK plugin that you install into Unity and you're basically good to go. Uh, side tangent, uh, for people working with Unity, be a little careful with what you grab from the Unity store, because uh, an asset bundle is basically code execution on your machine. So you, you might be dragging in a ball, but that ball might have a script. Uh, so uh, this is what the plugin looks like. Uh, let me uh, minimize this little thing that's in the way. And uh, uh, you can, anything you can make in Unity pretty much, you can put in VRChat with some, some restrictions. And um, uh, in Unity, uh, most of the objects that you can bring in derive something called a mono behavior. Uh, and those would inherently allow a script, uh, but uh, they basically don't let you ship assemblies with your code. So you can reference existing scripts, but you can't really bundle in a new one unless you're a special developer that can load code out of Dan. And there are really two types of user content. There's avatars, and then there's worlds. And they have largely similar attack surfaces uh, because they're all Unity components, uh, but the interaction's a little different. If you have an avatar, that's an exploit. You just yeah, I'm, am I too loud or why does it turn off? From this one, it's interfering. Uh, move further back, you're saying, okay. Yeah, we're getting debugged. Um, all right, uh, if you have an avatar, you just walk in, you drop an exploit. So Charlie Miller and Dino did that many years ago in, in Second Life with a bad QuickTime renderer. And then in Malicious World, you do have to lure somebody in to exploit them. 
And they do some whitelisting. They're mainly concerned about performance because you can make a virtual dress that is so complicated that it will slow down everybody's machine. And then they won't be able to enjoy VR chat. So they're really careful about performance for what you're building. Uh, and they whitelist the different things. But you're pretty much a game level designer. People get really creative. They make mecha warriors. Uh, they make small little anime girls. They make bananas. I like to be a giant python snake slithering around. That's currently my favorite. Um, and you got things like op uh, collision detection, um, all kinds of things that you can do in a game, basically. Uh, there's one component uh, that we looked at uh, that we found our first bug in. Uh, and it lets you play videos from YouTube. And then you can basically show up and make a little canvas and sit around on the couch in virtual reality watching YouTube with your friends. And this is something people do like every night, hang out with their virtual buddies. It's green. All right. It runs called Tube DL. I'm going to start unplugging stuff. Yeah, we got some art interference. Actually, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's stop the virtual reality from leaking out again. Yeah, it's funny, my teammate set up his uh, VR. Uh, he couldn't see anything, it didn't work. But he could hear a police radio. And uh, oddly enough, it was because uh, he lives above an HVAC unit, so stuff was coming over the power line. So he was like, yeah, my VR is not working, but I can hear people. So I might go to therapy later, figure out what's going on. Uh, but don't worry, I think I'm OK. I was like, all right, dude, let us know. And um, so this YouTube DL thing, uh, it, it's actually a separate program that's going to run. And it takes in a URL. And it had no sanitization. So you could do parameter injection. And uh, YouTube DL has a few interesting arguments, uh, things like exec. and uh, yeah, exec sounds great, but it wasn't that easy. It wasn't that easy, unfortunately, because there are other arguments in front that took precedence. Uh, so we had to find a little workaround because exec wouldn't run right away. Um, but there's some other stuff that's interesting. Uh, write pages. And write pages basically let us download a file. And um, we use this to write a configuration file uh, that would run a command because the configuration file would take precedence over the other arguments. Uh, so we broke this out into two steps to get our RCE. And uh, we set it up in the helpful VRChat SDK with the trigger. Uh, and we would basically run YouTube DL twice, once to download our file, and a second time to run it with our custom configuration. Uh, that would uh, trigger everything, um, take a little bit, and then you could run stuff like command, uh, except you were running this on other people's computers when they came to hang out with you in VR chat. So they fixed this pretty quick, because they thought that was a bad idea. And there's a shit ton of more attack surface. Uh, Unity itself is a huge attack surface. So that game engine was never designed as an attack surface to defend. Uh, but separate from that, all the network is done with something known as Photon. Um, I think we had a talk about anti-cheat, so maybe some of you guys have looked at Photon before. It's a, a pretty cool protocol. Uh, you can do both real-time and asynchronous communications. You can set up peer-to-peer -peer channels, or you can do client-to-server. It's super flexible. If you're a game developer, it's about all you need. And they do have some encryption features. Most games don't use them at all. Um, but another real problem is, uh, they don't really do authentication ever. Uh, game developers haven't really overlapped much with the security scene. And they think crypto sounds good. They do it, but incorrectly. And uh, most games that use this are 
basically susceptible to man in the middle attacks. And um, um, maybe one other thing worth saying is that it's not just VRChat that uses this, it's really a lot of different games. Uh, and then I'll speak uh, quickly about high fidelity. Uh, so high fidelity is dreaming big. High fidelity will enable planetary scale virtual space with rooms for billions of people served by billions of computers. So planetary scale uh, implies just Earth, but they're probably also thinking about Mars and wherever else Tony Stark wants to go. And uh, the really cool thing about it, though, is it's completely open source and it is decentralized. Uh, these guys legitimately want to make this accessible because they were inspired by books like Neuromancer and Snow Crash, and what they're trying to build is a metaverse, and they're focused on content creation, which seems to be a theme in VR. And uh, it's quite high resolution. I like to think that's why it's called Hi-Fi. Uh, but you also need a good computer to run it right now. And uh, they have an architecture that I mentioned is a bit decentralized. They want to run some global services where they can run a marketplace to encourage content creators to make stuff and get compensated and also do stuff like identity management. But the actual worlds will run on anybody's computer. And uh, all this is open source. It's actively developed. It's available today. And um, a little bit more about the global services. Uh, they're run by Hi-Fi. Uh, it's a startup. They've got a lot of funding. Uh, and they really uh, j just do a few things for you. They authenticate users, verify identity. Uh, they're doing it correctly. They've got things like SSL, and they're using the OAuth for identity. Uh, and then they manage this lookup. So you pick a place name, and they will translate it to somebody's server somewhere. And the domains are really like the servers where the VR runs. Uh, they've got a few different uh, abstractions. They've got something called entities. Uh, these are things like for dynamic content. Uh, and then assets. Think about like just those image files, those movie files that you want to put in. Uh, the servers also have logic for managing avatars, for managing audio, messages. Uh, it's really well abstracted and it is meant for a lot of future development. And the uh, communication model is that VR clients will connect to these domains. It's not peer-to-peer -peer like some of these others might be. Uh, and they do that for privacy. They only want the domain to know the IP address of everybody. And uh, one uh, fun thing is that HiFi is very scriptable. And uh, they've got JavaScript available throughout the server as well as throughout the clients. And um, their engine is based on Qt5, which embeds JavaScript core. And uh, scripting, always fun. Uh, so we set up a custom domain. Uh, we created an entity in script. We saw that they load stuff over HTTP. That's not too great. And uh, so this was our exploit. Quite simple. And uh, from here, you could load stuff over UNC paths and so on. And uh, if you guys have ways to do like exploiting this, feel free to let me know. But they fixed this pretty quick as well. And uh, besides the JavaScript engine, they have a lot of custom APIs. Uh, and all this user-generated content. And what's interesting is they've written pretty much their own game engine here. So there's a lot of fresh code that hasn't really been looked at. Yeah. This was a, have you guys heard of Vaporwave? Uh, th this was about somebody experiencing Vaporwave and they're like, yeah, yeah, this is fun. And this is kind of how I feel about the security of VR right now. At least it looks good. And um, wh why should we care? So there's quite a few uh, social risks here. Uh, people are vulnerable when they can't see where they're going. And uh, if you've not tried VR before, it feels like you're there with someone else. That's why we use it for our team building. Uh, but then concerns about cyberbullying become that much more real. And uh, there's a few ways I think we should be improving it. And I know some people already are working and thinking about these things. Um, you can talk about some of the quick security design wins that are there, uh, some hardening that game developers should really know about, and uh, the opportunity that people have to start fresh. Uh, probably one of my biggest concerns is that there's basically no privacy in these games today. Uh, there might be encryption, but there's no authentication. Um, 
And I'm talking about even authentication from client to server. Even that is not correct, typically, in basically all the games we looked at. And um, they need to do some design work here because people are having intimate conversations, personal things going on. And end-to-end uh, -end encryption would be the way to go. Another problem is many games have um, brute forceable identifiers, so people can just hop in on other people's chats by running through a list. And uh, it's, a, it's very sloppy. And uh, one of the things that uh, people have an opportunity here is because they're building custom hardware, they can start taking advantage of some of the security best practices we have today uh, with uh, second factor and devices. They're building hardware. They have an opportunity here to create pretty secure encryption and pretty secure authentication. But we're not doing it yet. And hardening-wise, uh, there's no... There's nothing like sandboxing and isolation in games, like you have with web browsers today. And uh, games aren't really hardened uh, the way uh, they should be. Uh, so many of the operating system mitigations are missing. And uh, some of these devices uh, are completely open. Others are a little bit more locked down. But they're generally quite open. So once the device is compromised, firmware can be replaced. And there's really no way for somebody to tell unless they go and start dumping. Uh, and pr probably the biggest thing is that there's a huge opportunity here uh, to start fresh. Uh, because this is an emerging technology. You don't have legacy software you need to support. Uh, so I think there's a real opportunity to just get away from some of these old technology. Like People love C++ because of how messed up it is. They don't love it because it's so safe. Uh, they, they like it because it's like, you, you have to be like in deep mode hacking. Like, I can't believe that works. Awesome. Go home at the end of the day feeling super cool. Uh, likewise, on the exploiting side, you kind of feel the same way. Like, wow, that was really complicated. Awesome. Uh, but we've got great new languages coming out. So maybe we should start building some of these stacks with those languages like Rust or Go. And we have an opportunity to create new paradigms. We don't need to repeat the mistakes of the web with things like CSRF and XSS, but we're doing so anyway. All right. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for uh, listening today. Um, yeah, if you want to hang out in VR later, uh, just find me, and we'll hang out, and I'll let you try out my Vive. And uh, if you have any questions, also feel free to email me. Uh, does anybody have any questions now? Oh. Uh, thank you guys, and thank you for putting up with the microphone issues.